This was the day after Independence Day. That's when Mary Baker Eddy was to speak. And the trip was tough. When they got there, the little girl wouldn't let her mom wash her hair or comb it or even wear a little straw hat for the little girl to wear. Mary Baker Eddy, she's going to speak outside from a balcony of her house out onto a big grassy area where the crowd would be. When she was finished speaking, people lined up down by the porch. Mary Baker Eddy came downstairs and was sitting there with some other people, and people lined up to say thank you, that kind of thing. When that family got to that location, there in front of Mary Baker Eddy, they didn't have time to speak, but they smiled at one another, and then someone in line just said, okay, move along. The mother wrote about this later. She said, I wish I could make the world know what I saw when Mary Baker Eddy looked at my children. She said, there was this love. This love, it was, it was like the light. It was just everywhere. And it was just all encompassing. The, the mom walked away from the crowd out into the trees and she said, that love was there too. It was an intelligent presence. She said she saw it just pouring out on the grass, on the trees, and she looked over at the crowd and there it was, just pouring out on them. And she started to cry. She asked, why haven't I known you before? Why haven't I known you always? A few hours later, she looked at her daughter and she saw that her daughter's head now was completely well. She'd been healed. She said her head now is back as the flat as the back of her hand. Now, that must have been a good day for the family, for that little girl, for the brother, having not to listen to it anymore. <laughs> for that mom, too, though. You know, it, it was something that changed that mother's life from that point forward. She's devoted the rest of her time just to prayer and healing. Now, everyone here in this room, we all have felt that love for other people. We've done that before, where you feel that kind of love for someone else. The love that it took to heal that little girl had to be something more than just a human emotion. It had to be, be something much bigger. I'm going to draw a little bit today on the, on the Bible, kind of to help us to answer that question, what is it that connects prayer with healing? You know, in that huge book, in the entire book of the Bible, in my opinion, I would say that the most significant sentence in that, that entire book is just three words. And that is that God is love. That God is love. Now, I know that many of you have noticed how in the last few years, this idea of God as love is more than just a religious thing, not just a Sunday thing. You notice how the world is thinking about God as love in more tangible, everyday terms. You notice that in the last oh, five or ten years. Maybe some of you are familiar with a book uh, a book called uh, Proof of Heaven. It's by a Harvard neurosurgeon named Dr. Eben Alexander. Proof of Heaven. Ever, any of you ever hear of that book? A lot. Huh. Um, it's an interesting book. I mean, this man, he taught at Harvard Medical School and some other places too. He served for a long time. His book isn't about neurosurgery, though. At least not directly. This book is very interesting. It's about an occasion when he became so ill that he ended up in a coma for eight or nine days. Now, his best friends, fellow neurosurgeons, were working on him, and they told him that there were times where he didn't have any brain activity showing at all. He wrote a book about it. Now, you'd think with no brain activity showing at all, he wouldn't have much to write about. But I'll tell you, this was his time of introduction to God as love. He writes about this. I've got it on a little card here, an excerpt from his book, and it's so interesting. 
listen to this. He comes to this conclusion in his book. After that tough experience, after all of his years working, but then almost losing his life, recovering, he says this. He says, love is without a doubt the basis of everything. Not some abstract, hard to fathom kind of love, but the day-to-day -day kind that everyone knows. The kind of love we feel when we look at our spouse and children, or even our animals. In its purest and most powerful form, this love is not jealous or selfish, but unconditional. This is the reality of realities, the incomprehensibly glorious truth of truths that lives and breathes at the core of everything that exists or that ever will exist. And no remotely accurate understanding of who and what we are can be achieved by anyone who does not know it and embody it in all of their actions. Now that's a pretty serious conclusion this man came to. That love is the basis of everything. Let me tell you folks, I think that's what I'm here to learn. If I can get that one lesson, I think I'm getting there. I think I'm, I'm making some progress. Love is the basis of everything. Now God as love, it's more than God is just loving you. God is ever-present, all-encompassing love. It's what connects us all. The love of God envelops us all. It, it enables us. It, it truly is the basis of everything. And it is that love that we turn to as a basis for prayer and healing. You notice that little family, when they met Mary Baker Eddy, they were only there in front of her for a moment. Just a moment. You know, that's kind of how this power of love works. It just takes a moment, but then your life is changed permanently. When the love of God touches you like that, it just changes everything. That mother sure changed her. It changed the direction of her life completely. You ever have somebody, oh, I don't know, somebody you know who you don't like very much. Maybe you work with this person or something. Whenever this person's around, you're a little tense. Can't wait to get out of his or her presence. Then maybe you do a project together, or you're at a party together or something, and you talk. And then you don't feel so bad about it. I, I, here's a good example of one of those. My daughter, she, uh, she works as a ballerina. That's her job. She's worked for a ballerina, as a ballerina for many years. Uh, the company to which she used to belong uh, was out in the middle of the United States. If you go to the ballet, you uh, or maybe you see it on TV, you know how beautiful it is. You see those pretty little girls in their white tutus, and they just look so nice. You know, in a typical ballet company, when they put on a production, you only really, they only can have maybe one or two lead parts. So many of these beautiful little ballerinas in their white tutus, they will, they'll kill the grandmother for a part. <laughs> now there was one particular ballerina, a woman in my daughter's company, who for years, always, they just always fought. And I would hear my daughter talk about it, how they would just, ugh, you know, they, she said, she's just undermining all, me all the time, Dad, and no, oh, it's just terrible. Well, she told me about, um, too long ago, she was in a, a studio, probably about this size, rehearsing for a part for an upcoming production. And when she was finished, she walked out into the hall and she had a frown on her face. That other ballerina was there and uh, asked my daughter, what's wrong? What's going on? And my daughter held up one of her point shoes. You've seen those ballerinas, point shoes. Held it up and said, all oh, these new point shoes, they just don't fit. I, I can't turn on them. Well, the other woman reached in her bag took out a brand new pair of point shoes and said, we wear the same size, try these. And um, my daughter tried them, and in fact, they did work, they worked well. My daughter called me up about three days after that, and she said, Dad, it's terrible. <laughs> We're good friends now. <laughs> now that's what I'm talking about. It just took a moment of unselfish love, that little girl, that other girl, showing uh, and 
giving a pair of point shoes to my daughter just took a moment that erased years of animosity. Now, a pair of point shoes like that for a professional dancer, they're not cheap, they're about $95. I've paid for a lot of them. And um, <laughs> so that's no little thing. She wasn't planning on doing that. It was a spontaneous idea, but that's what I'm talking about. This love of God, when it touches you, it just takes a moment, but then everything's different after that. I'm going to tell you about a book that I read every day right along with my Bible. I've got a copy of it right here. It's this book. It's called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. If you have a friend who brought you here to this lecture today, a friend who sometimes maybe goes online and studies things about Christian science, or maybe goes to a Christian science church once in a while, maybe your friend has told you about this book, Science and Health, or the author, Mary Baker Eddy, the woman I was telling you about there on the porch. Now, you read through this book, and you notice immediately Mary Baker Eddy's deep love for God. It just pours off the pages. She devoted everything about herself to that love and what it can do to heal. She speaks, I've got it on my little card, she's got a quote in this book that talks about that moment. She says, she says this towards the beginning of the book. She says, become conscious for a single moment that life and intelligence are purely spiritual, neither in nor of matter, and the body will then utter no complaints. If suffering from a belief in sickness, you'll find yourself suddenly well. Sorrow is turned into joy when the body is controlled by spiritual life, truth, and love. Hence, the hope of the promise Jesus bestows. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, because I go unto my Father. Because the ego is absent from the body and present with truth and love. Now, when Mary Baker Eddy uses those words truth and love in this case, she actually capitalizes them in her book. She employs those words as names for God. They're biblically based names. We've been talking about God as love, God as truth. Now, foundational to our work that we're going to do here in this room today is a sentence relating to this. And it is something probably you'll remember for a long time. There's a place where Mary Baker Eddy in this book says, in speaking of Jesus, first in the list of Christian duties, Jesus taught his followers the healing power of truth and love. The healing power of truth and love. Now, if Jesus walked in this door right now, and he met all of us for the first time, the initial thing he would teach us is the healing power of truth and love. I'll give you an example of, of how that all works. A few years ago, I was involved in an accident. I fell from a height of about 10 feet, landed on my back. I could stand up and walk, but I was definitely hurting. Now, from what you've heard so far, you could tell that I'm the kind of person who, when challenged like that, is going to pray about it. And I did. I turned to prayer immediately. I was very interested in God as truth. And this truth, I turned to, to learn more about it. I actually turned to the Bible. For about three days, I just really studied the words in the Bible, especially at the very beginning of the Bible, right at the beginning where it talks about how God created me. I was so interested in that. In the beginning, it talks about how I'm made in the likeness of God. That was really getting me. Now, I knew I was making progress. The reason I knew it was that the mental pictures of the accident were replaying less. And this idea of being God's likeness was gaining ground in my thought. That's how I knew I was making progress. See, the way that God answers your prayer is by changing your thought. That's how that works. The reason it works that way is because your thought embraces everything you experience. Initially, when I first started praying, I remember that um, 
I would pray and I would ask God to change things outside of my thought, like my foot or my bank account or my school teacher, stuff like that. But uh, you guys are all looking now that I've talked about Jesus walking in the door. <laughs> now that's the best, that's the best uh, introduction you could ever imagine. You don't, know, you don't know why everybody's so happy to see you. But... <laughs> There's some seats up here, come on out. There's one up on the corner. How many more? Raise your hand if you got a seat by you if you want. Come on up, come on up here. There's one right there. We're good. Kim, you can sit down. We got one left. You know, we thought, how many should we get? How about 70? All right, that's one for you. I'll uh, all right, for those who walked in, you're going to have to ask the people what I was talking about. <laughs> Am I standing in the right place? All right, good. You have to edit that part You can out. move wherever you want. <laughs> All right, the reason I, I knew I was making progress, my thought was changing. I would asked God earlier on to change things like my foot or my, my school teacher, my bank account. But the way God answers your prayers is by changing your thoughts. So that's what I was watching. I wasn't hurting any less. But my thoughts were changing. About three days later, I had to get on a plane and travel up to Massachusetts to do some work there. I went a day early. My, my brother-in-law, he lives over in Atlanta. My brother-in-law uh, at that time lived uh, in, in Massachusetts. And one of his favorite things to do is play golf. He really loves to play golf. And he arranged for us to go play golf at a very nice course. You know how people, when they do that, well, I remember we got there, drove up to the parking lot of the golf course, and I didn't tell him I was hurting, but he looked over at me and he said, Mark, how about um, if uh, before we tee off, we go hit balls on the driving range? And I looked at him and I went, oh, okay. <laughs> well, we, we got up onto the driving range, and maybe you hit balls on a driving range before. I was standing on a big artificial turf mat. They gave me a, a little wire bucket of golf balls, and I poured them out on the golf on the mat. And I would roll the balls over with the end of my club into the center of the mat, and I worked hard. I was working hard to hit the ball straight, and I'm praying. I'm not praying hard. And as I'm, I'm hitting those balls, I'm hurting, and I'm praying. And you know what? It really struck me. Remember, basic to our work today is that line out of the book Science and Health by Mary Baker Eddy. It's that, that line. First in the list of Christian duties, Jesus taught his followers the healing power of truth and love. And it struck me as I'm standing there on the, on the driving range, well, for the last three days, I have definitely been doing the truth part great. I have been connecting with this truth in the Bible, especially that idea that I'm God's likeness. Now, when I'm talking about God as truth and love, I'm not saying that there's two gods. I mean, each one of you here have more than one name. If you understand God as truth and as love, as the Bible describes, it helps you to know more about the essence, the fullness of God. Well, I definitely had not been connecting with the fullness of God. I'd just been thinking about the words in the book, in the book like the, the truth. And I thought, you know what? I gotta, I gotta open up to the love of God. I gotta do both parts, truth and love. That's what Jesus would have me do. And so there on the driving range, I stopped. In the Bible, it says, my presence shall go with thee. My presence shall go with thee. Now, I knew then that the, the, the God was there, right there on that golf course. And as soon as I, I became open to the love of God, I felt it. Oh, I felt, it felt so good. It felt familiar. And it just, uh, I just basked in it there on the driving road, standing there. And then something interesting happened. In that love, in that holy love, God said to me, said to me right in my heart, he said, Mark, be aware of this. Be aware. Neither God nor God's likeness ever were in an accident. Now, I was surprised by that. I, was, I didn't expect to hear that. I felt such love. I felt God's love along with that message. I knew it was genuine, and it made complete sense. Certainly God had never been in, 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 in any accident. If I'm God's likeness, clearly I had to either. Now, the moment I yielded to that fact, I was free. 
I mean, immediately on the driving range, I was completely fine. And uh, I've remained that way since. I shot in the 70s that day. It's a hard course. <laughs> but better than the 70s was the lesson I learned. First in the list of Christian duties, Jesus taught his followers the healing power of truth and life. I needed to do the whole thing. The whole thing. In the Bible, it says that we should work to study the Spirit and not get so caught up in the letter. Well, the letter, you could say, are the words, the words you read in the Bible or in that book I've been showing you, Science and Health, or other books that you love. Those words, I mean, you can tell how much I love them. I love the letter. I'm in those books every day. I eat them up. But I would never be satisfied with just knowing the words, just knowing the letter. I want to know what they mean. I want to know the spirit, what they feel like. You ever have somebody do something nice for you, pick up a pencil for you or something, and you say, thank you. There may be other times where somebody says, does something very nice for you, very nice. And at that time, you say, oh, thank you. Now, in both cases, you use the same letters, the same words, thank you. But in the second case, you actually felt the spirit of gratitude along with them. That's what I'm talking about. And that relates to the truth and love that is God. You can think of the truth related to the letter. And the love as what gives meaning to that truth. It gives the spirit, the feel, behind the ideas that we all love so much in the Bible. Now, in order to really get a handle on this, let's do a little exercise. Uh, you heard in the introduction that I am from New Mexico. New Mexico. Have very many of you here ever been up, been over to New Mexico? A lot of people. Why do you live? <laughs> it's beautiful here. I mean, it really is. It's just so beautiful here. Uh, I mean, I see it from way up high probably every other day because I change planes so much in Atlanta. So I fly over where you are. I love it. Look how it is. Well, New Mexico. For those of you who haven't been there, it's not just flat desert. The Rocky Mountains, they come on down all the way from Canada, almost to the bottom of New Mexico. And where I live, I live up in the mountains. So there are fir trees there, but there's cactus too on the ground. And in the winter, it's very cold, it snows. I want you to use your imagination. Imagine coming to my house for a visit, okay? You arrive in the evening, imagine this, you arrive in the evening and you're staying at my house, you're in my guest room, I put you to bed, and as you are about to go to sleep, you look out the window and you see, since it's the middle of winter, you see snowflakes, snowflakes coming down. Well, the air in New Mexico is very different than the air in Georgia. There is hardly any, any water in the air at all in New Mexico. So when it snows, the snow can be very, very light, really fluffy. You, you can't hardly make a snowball out of it. Well, imagine you sleep all night, you wake up in the morning, and um, you see that, looking out the window, that all the clouds are gone. The, uh, the sky is as blue as that woman's, is that a dress or a top? Stand up for everyone to see. And uh, you walk in, you walk out to, down the steps, out into the snow, and you feel, all right, we've got a few more in here. Come on up here, we've got one chair here. One there. I think we're good. Can, can we get one more right here? Uh, come on. <laughs> well, you walk down the steps out into the snow and you feel it on your feet, or at least you try because it's so light. I know you can imagine that. You see snow just everywhere. It's all over the trees. Even though there's no wind, imagine picturing this. You, you, there's no wind, but you see some snow falling off of the branch of one of the trees. The sun is right behind it. It acts like a prism. Besides the whiteness of the snow, you see 
green and blue and yellow in the snow, looking like a prism. You ever see that before? It's pretty. Then imagine, just closing your eyes and facing the sun yourself, and immediately you feel the warmth of the sun on your face. The longer you face the sun, the warmer you feel. All right, that was good. You all used your imaginations well, and you felt sunshine in a way. Imagine that. That's good. That's one way of describing sunshine. Now I'm going to describe sunshine in a different way, in a different way, but i got to read this part, and it's, this, it's the letter using it. It's not the spirit. Ready? Sunshine. An ongoing atomic process where the sun is generating energy by the nuclear fusion of a hydrogen nuclide in the universe. In its core, the sun fuses 620 million metric tons of hydrogen each second. Photons are electromagnetic byproducts of this nuclear fusion, and some of them travel towards the Earth at more than 186,000 miles per second. Now that was, that was the letter describing sunshine, and we need the letter. If we don't know the speed of light, not even our cell phones work. But as I read that, as I read the letter, I doubt very many of you here felt warm on your face, did you? No. That's the letter. You need to translate that into the spirit. And that relates a lot to prayer and healing. You need to feel the spirit of the ideas God provides for you. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if many of you came here today maybe praying about something. Praying about something in relation to yourself. Or maybe you're praying for somebody you love very much. Or maybe you're praying for your world. Let me ask you a question. Kind of a personal question. If, instead of just listening to me talk about this power of love and truth to heal, just talking about it, what would you all say to actually experiencing it here and now in this room? Actually doing it. Would that be okay? I mean, you don't have to get up or anything like that, but would that be okay? Would you feel comfortable okay. with that? Okay, let's do that. All right, let's do another exercise then, but we're not going to have to use our imaginations. We don't have to imagine anything. I know that every single person in this room, at one point or another, has either said to someone or had it said to themselves, each one of you have heard somebody say, God loves you. God loves you. That's a very common idea. God loves you. You know what? It's most often left in the, the letter category. People rarely go beyond knowing the words God loves you to actually feeling God's love, actually experiencing it. Where was I? The day before yesterday, I was in California. And I was in traffic. I, I saw a bumper sticker on a car right in front of me. And it said, God loves you. And then it said, and I'm trying hard too. It said, <laughs> was funny. I remember the very first time I ever really ventured forward into letting God love me, at least being conscious of it. I tried it for about two or three seconds. And then I withdrew. And I said to God, I said, God, oh. Don't waste it on me. It's not like I didn't deserve it. It just felt sort of selfish to let the focus of God's love just be me, you know? Well, that's not what we're going to do here today. We're actually going to open up to this wonderful presence, this ultimate goodness that is God, that is divine love. See, in order for the love of God to be all in your life, it needs to be all in your thought. And so, in our exercise right now, here's how we're going to start. We're going to begin by just being, pre being conscious of the presence of God. As I mentioned, in the Bible it says, my presence shall go with thee. So, you know God is right here in this room, right next to Sanford Stadium. My presence shall go with thee. So what we want to do is just be conscious of, of God's presence, and then I want you to let God love you. I mean, just let God love you. 
move it beyond just words, God loves you, to actually feeling it. Don't be embarrassed to open up to the love of God, okay? Don't be embarrassed to do that. All right, those are the first two steps. Acknowledge God's presence, then let just God love you. We'll do it for 10 or 15 seconds. I'll do it with you. Go. somebody take a big pitcher of water and pour it into a glass. Think of uh, God's love right now like that. Let God just pour it on and fill you with love. In fact, fill to overflow. The Bible describes God as infinite. Infinite love. So that means there's plenty to go around. It's okay. Just spill it. Let it, let it flow right out the top. All right, and, and the next step in our little exercise, we're going to start the same way. Acknowledge God's presence. Let God love you. I mean, just let God love you. Let it overflow. Overflow into everyone here in this room. Okay? Three parts. Here we go. to get into. You know, when you're in a public place, it's good to do that. I did it the other day. I was up in New York City. I was on a subway. You know how loud it is, noisy on a subway like that. It was bad. Day. I just stood there, let God love me, and I felt it just overflow right out into everyone in the car. It's good. Do this. Next time you go to, to Walmart, you know when it's time to check out and you go to the line and you go, I can't believe how long this line is. Did they ever hire anybody here? <laughs> At that time, that's a good time to do it. Just stand there and let God love you. Let God love you. And then feel that love just overflow. Overflowing to everyone in the Walmart, all right? If you do that, Walmart will never be the same. Try it. I mean, it's a good habit to get into. You know, when... Jesus was just starting out. Before he did anything, he was being baptized. And that is when he heard out loud, and all the people around heard it too. Jesus heard out loud, right there at the baptism, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. He heard God say that. Now that must have been a good day for Jesus, don't you think? <laughs> This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I mean, picture this. What if you're walking out to your car and you hear outside, out loud, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I'm well pleased. Well, that kind of love, that would feel good. Now, Jesus knew he was our example. You know, the, the, the timing is interesting. Jesus hadn't done a thing yet. So God didn't love him that way because of what he'd accomplished. No, God loved him that way because of who he was. And that's why God loves you. Not because of what you've done, but because of just who you are. Now that's what it is to following Jesus' footsteps. It's one way. It's to acknowledge this wonderful love God has for you. All right. In our exercise now, we're going to do the final step. The final step. And we're going to start the same way. We're going to acknowledge the presence of God. Then the next step is to let God love you. 
just like on that. Then the third step, let it overflow. Just like that water pouring into the pitcher, let, let it just spill it all over everyone, all right? Just let it spill. Then, in that tender, holy, powerful love of God, allow God to tell you something wonderful about yourself. Okay? All right, there's four steps. Acknowledge God's presence. Be so grateful for it. Let God love you. Let it overflow. And then in that holy love, in that tender love, let God just tell you something wonderful about you. I'll do the same thing. Here we go. That's so good. Now what you just heard is a secret between just you and God. Jesus talks about this in the Bible. He says, when you go to God in communion like that, what you hear in secret, you keep it there. It's just between you and God. Probably many of you heard something about yourself you didn't expect. I know I did. That's sometimes the surprise of it. Now, Show your gratitude for what God gave you by really letting it become now what you think. Let it become your whole outlook, your whole approach. Bite down on it. Bite down on it like a bulldog. You guys know about bulldogs here? <laughs> I think you do. Um, bite down and let it hold, let it stay. Remember, basic to our work today is that idea out of science and hell that First in the list of Christian duties, Jesus taught his followers the healing power of truth and love. Now you guys have been experiencing it. You opened up to the love of God. If you haven't yet felt it, continue to do so. You will. It's here. If you haven't yet heard anything about yourself, keep listening. Keep basking in the love of God. By the end of the day, you'll see. You'll hear it. Right in your heart. All right. What happened? You opened up to the love of God, and what did you hear in that love? Truth. There it is. The healing power of truth and love. Now you're connecting prayer with healing, because it's not just words. See, when the love of God is behind that truth that you were just given, it has an authority that's beyond people, beyond the world. There is much more authority to it. Remember as I'm standing there in the driving range and God said, Mark, be aware. Neither God nor God's like this were ever in an accident. Those, that was the truth and I knew it. Yet it now had the authority of God's love behind it. When your thought yields to that truth in God's love, you're doing it right. That's exactly what it is. I'll give you another example of how that works. Uh, I know a little girl who one summer, she was over at her house, her friend's house, swimming. And uh, it was dinner time, so she had to go home. So she got on her bike to drive home. She put her towel on her handlebars to drive home, and one corner of the towel got caught in the, the spokes of her front wheel, stopped the wheel, and she went over the falls and hit her face and head on the, on the pavement. That wasn't too far from her house, and some of her neighbors saw what happened and, and actually helped get her home. Now, her mother and father were people who all their lives had turned to this power of truth and love to heal. They'd done it all their lives. 
they didn't just have some blind faith that maybe God was going to touch their daughter's life. No. They had an understanding, a knowledge, just as you all have been learning. They, could, they knew how to turn to this wonderful divine love, always present, for the truth, for the intelligence of God, in order to have a basis for their prayer. And naturally, that's what they did. The next day, the father went to work, the mother stayed home, and the little girl told me how they turned to truth. They really turned to truth, especially in the Bible. The little girl couldn't read it because one of her eyes was swollen shut, so her mother just read to her. And she told me that one particular idea really stood out as her mother was reading to her, and it was the same one I mentioned to you at the very beginning, this idea of being the likeness of God. That really struck home. And for about two or three days, the mother just read, looked at the truth in those books I've been telling you about, the Bible and science and health. The mother also did something a mother would do. She didn't want her little girl to be shocked by what she looked like, so she put <coughs> sheets over most of the mirrors in the house. Now, about the third day, the little girl peeked in the mirror behind one of those sheets. And you know what? She was shocked. She was shocked. The reason I know all these details is that little girl now is my wife. So I know the little details. She looked in the mirror. She, she was shocked, but in a good way. Remember, for three days, she'd been connecting with this truth that she's God's likeness. And when she looked in the mirror, she goes, wow, that, that's not me. That's not me at all. I'm God's likeness. That's definitely not me. That's truth, isn't it? That's truth. Absolutely right. That is completely factual. Remember, first in the list of Christian duties, Jesus taught his followers the healing power of truth and love. All right, so she'd been doing the truth part, her and her mom, just great. Here comes the love part. Picture her there, standing there in front of the mirror like that. She was one of those children, one of those kids, who all her life always had tried to be really good. Always tried to be good. I know that she was probably feeling guilty. In fact, I know she was. Feeling guilty for making her parents so worried about her. That's how she was. Just always trying to get there, trying to become good. And, and as she's standing there in front of the mirror, she said that, oh, she felt the love of God just wash over her like a torrent. And she heard God say to her, said, Renee, Renee, you don't have to try and be good anymore. You don't have to do that anymore. Don't try and be good. You're my likeness. You're already good. In fact, you're perfect. Now, that surprised her, but she knew, oh, it was so true. Remember how it only takes a moment for the love of God to touch your life and just change everything. If to the degree God changes your thought, you allow that to happen, you invite the law of God, the power of God, to bear on your thought, which experience, which embraces all your life, everything you experience. Well, there she was, picture that. God says to her, don't, don't try to be good. You're my likeness, you're already good. You're perfect. And my wife felt such love with that. There's the truth and love together. In that moment that she yielded to it, her eye opened. And by the next day around noon, she was out playing with her friends, her head and face, completely clear, absolutely clear. And there it is again, that healing power of truth and love. It's quick, it's, it's not complicated. But it's more than just words. It's more than just words in a book. It's not just the letter. It's the, the feel, the spirit. When Jesus met a man who had leprosy, the Bible describes what happens. Upon meeting that man, it says, Jesus was moved with compassion. Talk about feel, moved with compassion. He didn't just quote words out of the Old Testament trying to help the man. No, he felt what those words meant. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. That's the healing power of truth and love. 
Now, if this wonderful presence that is God is the basis of everything, if it's truly ever-present, so good as you've been hearing me talk, why is it sometimes, occasionally, that we may become so afraid, or so angry, or maybe feel so victimized that, that we just want to go out in the garden and eat worms? <laughs> why is that? <laughs> I'll tell you why. It's because we stop making a point to acknowledge God's love for us, just like we did a few minutes ago. We stop being intentional about it. It's that important. It's vital to invest in your life times where you just bask in the love of God. Jesus did this all the time. Now, in this book I've been telling you about, Science and Health with Keeping the Scriptures, if you don't have a copy, get a copy. I see copies there on the table back there. I got one right here, too. Um, there's more in this book and in the Bible than I could ever say about this topic in an hour. But if you get yourself a copy and you start reading through it, you're probably going to come to what is the best known sentence, the, the most famous sentence in the book. And that sentence is that divine love always has met and always will meet every human need. Divine love always has met and always will meet every human need. In many, many places around the world, that is written on the walls of churches. Now, why is that such a famous sentence? I'll tell you. It's because the human need, in other words, whatever you're praying about, I don't care what it is, whatever you're praying about, really when it is distilled down to the problem, it's that in some way or another, you or who you're praying for, it would imply that something has separated you from the love of God. One way or another, it just comes down to that. So it doesn't matter what you're praying about. It doesn't matter what it is. Divine love always has met and always will meet every human need because every human need is always for the same thing, divine love. It's always a request for divine love. Now, you read through the Bible, one of Jesus' best known sayings is also written on the walls of churches. It's that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. There it is again. The healing power of truth and love. Love and truth. There it is. Sure. Divine love meets the human need. With what? Truth. It makes you free. Free from what? From real illness? Real lack? Real injustice? No, God, God is really the basis of everything. So what this truth does is it makes you free from even the thought, the belief in lack or illness or injustice. Freeze your thought. Remember, that's the only place you need to work, just within your own thought. Experiment with that. Watch how when you pray, don't pray out of your environment, just address your own thought. Think of your, your consciousness, your thought, as a big, like a big chalkboard, a big whiteboard, you know the kind you have in school? If you leave that mental chalkboard blank, you leave it blank, somebody's going to write on it. Somebody will write on it. And most often it's not God. It's just thoughts that the world has. You might see sit, written on your mental chalkboard. You might see written, you might see written, I am such an idiot. I'm such an idiot. You might see that written on your mental chalkboard more than once. You might see written on your mental chalkboard, everyone else is such an idiot. <laughs> There's countries I've gone to where that's like a lifestyle. Um, I was on a plane the other day. I was changing planes. I don't know where I was. I was looking. I saw a man reading his Wall Street Journal. And one of the stories on the front page was uh, all about uh, the winter being a specific kind of flu season. You might see that written on your, on your mental chalkboard. That winter is flu season. You might see that. There are all sorts of things all just a plethora of things that 
would imply you're separated from the love of God, one way or another. That, that might be written on your, your mental whiteboard like that. It might happen. <laughs> now, let's do this. Let's, let's just say you have something like that written on your mental chalkboard. It's just, don't worry, God didn't put it there. It's just the thoughts of the world. But you know, it sit there long enough, and you read it long enough, you actually think you believe it. Like, like that first one, I am such an idiot. If that's sitting there on your mental chalkboard, it might have sat there for years. It really might have just sat there for years. Your first step is to erase it. Now, in order to erase something that's been there for years, you're going to need a good eraser. You own the best eraser possible. That eraser is the love of God. The love of God. As soon as you do what we've been doing and just open up to God's love for you, your mental whiteboard your mental chalkboard is just clean. At that point, then you're free to allow God to write on it. Let God write. Maybe it starts the same way. I am such an, but let God finish the sentence. That's prayer. That's doing it right. That, that self-criticism, destructive self-criticism, I see it all around. It's got to stop. I'm such an idiot. Let that go. It would have to be true for God in order for it to be true for God's likeness. So you know it can't be so. Let God just love you. Wash that clean. And let God tell you who you are. What about the other one I mentioned? Everyone else is such an idiot. Everyone else is such an idiot. There may be somebody you know. Maybe somebody at work. Or maybe somebody in your distant past. I don't know. Somebody who, ugh. Everyone agrees. He or she is such an idiot. Well... I don't know if you're willing, but maybe you are. Even though that's written on your mental chalkboard, very big letters, so-and-so is such an idiot. To move forward out of that, you've suffered long enough with that. How do you wash your mental chalkboard? How do you get it clean? You talk. It's Sunday, I know you're not supposed to talk on Sundays when someone's up here, but what do you do? Erase you erase it with what? Love of God. That's right. Just let God love you. And I don't mean just words. Oh, God loves me. Don't do that. Don't feel it. Oh, you know what that feels like. Just feel it. As soon as you let the love of God wash your thought clean, then let God tell you about that individual. It's going to take a lot of humility often to do that. You've got to swallow your pride in order to let God wash that away. Let God tell you about that individual. How... God sees that person. If you do that, that's prayer. You may be the first one ever to pray for that person. It will help that individual, certainly. But you know what? It's really going to help you. Try it and see. Watch how that works. Oh, let God wash you clean and give you the truth. How about that, that third one I mentioned? That uh, the winter is flu season. Briefly, let me tell you how that was put on your mental chalkboard. Maybe some of you have heard of this before. Actually, it's only a habit we have here in the world. It's only 400 years old. Winter being flu season, it's only 400 years old. It started in Southern Europe. The people in Southern Europe had been invaded many times by people from the East and North, and so they were very suspicious of anyone from away. In the winter, you've been to Europe, maybe you've seen how occasionally there can be times where there's a very cold wind that blows from north to south. The people in the southern part of Europe would feel that cold wind, and they would believe superstitiously that that was coming from the people up north, that they were sending that cold wind. And along with the wind, an evil influence, an evil influence to make them ill, make them sick. And obediently, they did. Now, those people in southern Europe got in boats, and came all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to Georgia, and that is why we find written on our mental chalkboards that the winter is supposed to be flu season. <laughs> flu season. Evil influence. Influence has is the basis for influenza. It's related. That's where that comes from. Evil influence. Influenza, the flu. <laughs> we have it written on our mental chalkboards. Now, I, I don't have to tell you what to do. You know, if that's written on your mental chalkboard, what to do about that, you let God love you, wash it clean. 
then let God tell you what season it really is. After the lecture today, be sure and do that, all right? Let me ask you a question. How many million people live in Georgia? Anybody know? How many? Four, five, three? Three million people? Four in Atlanta. Four? Four, four in Atlanta. Atlanta? Four in Atlanta. I don't know. There's, there's got to be six or eight million people here, man. Okay. Well, ten? Okay. All right, we'll say ten. I'll bet you ten. Um, they're all there. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen them all day. Um, let me ask you. There are maybe 10 million people in Georgia who have written on their mental chalkboards that the winter is flu season. If you personally do what we are talking about, allow God to wash you clean with his love and tell you what season it really is, well, then that's 10 million to one. You, you're the only one who changed. Those aren't very good odds, are they? Maybe some of you here have heard that, that idea, that statement, that one with God is a majority. Did you ever hear that before? Yeah. One with God is a majority. You know what? I tell you here now, I admit it, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that even slightly. Not even a little bit, no. Because God truly is the only presence, the only authority, the sole power in this world, the basis of everything. One with God isn't just a majority. It's a monopoly. <laughs> and so when you agree with God like that, you actually hold all the authority. You're reflecting the authority of God. Jesus made a career of doing that. He didn't care what anybody thought. He didn't care what anybody believed or what anyone else feared. He didn't care about others' opinions. He says right in black and white in the Bible, he says he was about his father's business. He wasn't even about his own business. He was about his father's business. And we know what that's like. When we allow God to wash us clean and give us the truth on our mental chalkboards, we're about our father's business. Exactly. That is the joy of life. It is what connects prayer with healing. It is something that you do once and you're hooked on forever. You just want it all the time. And don't think you're pestering God. Don't go to God, I want more love. Remember, God is infinite love. Let it fill you. Let it overflow spill on everyone else. I know you'll do it. There's a place uh, in the Bible I think about quite a bit it's something that uh, I want you all to think about, too. It says to keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. I tell you, I don't have a tattoo, but if I ever get one, it's going to be those words in reverse on my forehead, so I look in the mirror and remember to do it. It's that important. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You know, when Jesus was crucified and then appeared afterwards to his disciples. It's so interesting what he talks about in that final meeting. He, uh, he does, he, these are his friends, and he doesn't talk with them about the crucifixion or how hard it was in the cross or what he was doing in the tomb. No, you read about it. All he talks about with his friends is the love of God. That's all he talks about. You know, it struck me when I read that the other day. For him to be talking about that, and only that, through the hardest thing Jesus had to deal with, through that hardest thing, he must have been drawing on the love of God that whole time. Now, if Jesus, who is our example, turned to the love of God to get through the hardest thing, we too can draw on this love that is God to get through the hardest things in our lives. Now, you have heard me talk about this for a bit. As you've heard me describe this, this idea of it just taking a moment, when you're up against it and it's really hard for you, something's tough, and you feel the love of God and you learn something quick that just changes your life from that point forward. Does that sound familiar to anyone in here? Anybody in here have an experience like that where you... You were through maybe a tough time in your life. 
and then you felt the love of God and you learned something and changed. Anybody here? All right. Sir, would you mind just standing up and telling the group about that? Yeah, just tell them. They'd like to hear it. I would too. Just let them know. Um, I, I've had a, a, a kind of a strong suggestion of the flu. Of the flu? Yeah. And, uh, uh, had sat there and was working through the truth part of it. And, and just and repetition and everything else just all of a sudden felt, felt everything just wash every symptom, everything wrong. What now? You're, so you're there praying about it. How long have you been praying? Uh, it was... It, Okay, for a few hours. Now, you said that you felt just everything fall away, kind of wash away. I can tell you mean that. What, what happened? What, describe that. Like, what are you saying? Um, it, it, the best way I can describe it, it, it was like salt in the mouth. At it, it, the very instant, I I, 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 the, the thought connected, it just, um, it, everything clicked, and, and just, it's, it's almost you know, divine love just, just washing it. I love it. Now, what thought was it? What what, what idea? Do you remember or not? Uh, it, it's. I have that same thing. Yeah. So often, <laughs> you know, I can't remember the idea specifically. I mean, right. remember this likeness thing I've been telling you about. But the love of God was behind it. Now I can see it in your face that that was not just flu healing. It was sort of a life changer for you. It really was. Yeah. That, that was very How long did it take? What the? That washing. Know? The washing yes. I, 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 without going into detail, I stood up, went downstairs, and to uh, a surprise mother, you know, not so surprised mother, uh, <laughs> <laughs> said, I'm done. I got it. I'm done. <laughs> that is so good. You're very nice to do this. Now, don't tell people once in a while I make them stand up and talk about it. But he didn't know I was going to ask them. But that was so kind of you to do that because it helps us all to see, I can see it in your face. Now, it, it didn't have to be that complicated. You've been praying hard, but then all of a sudden, it was like you were a new man. Love, the Bible talks about how it makes us new like that, and that's just what's happened. And you see, when the love of God touches you like that, it's not a temporary thing. You can see in his eyes, and I've watched him a little bit in this lecture, I see how his eyes just are filled with this joy, this love of God after that, you know? Keep yourselves in the love of God. The Bible is right. I mean, it, it, in the weeks to come, don't just think, well, I did that on Sunday. In the weeks to come, will you all, even on your own, let God just love you. Keep doing that. Be conscious of it. Be intentional about letting God love you. If you, oh, I don't know, let's say you were making a big pot of soup, a big old pot of soup. It's boiling on the stove. And you decide to take a large sprig of rosemary and put it in the soup. If you tasted the soup right then, it wouldn't taste very different. But if you let the rosemary cook for a while in the soup, it would taste very different. The love of God is like that. Let God, let God's love just cook in you. For days, just let it cook in you. In a week, you will taste very different. <laughs> you know, um, I know that there's a, a big, a large symphony here. Maybe some of you here play a musical instrument, maybe a trumpet or a piano or a guitar. Try this. This is another way to keep yourself in the love of God. Think, instead of your instrument being a, a piano or a guitar or a trumpet, think of your instrument as your entire day. As your entire day. And at any point on your day, on your instrument, you can play a concert. A concert of God's See, it's very natural for you to bask in the torrent of God's love. It's just natural for you to do. But it's also natural for you to be transparent to it in your interactions with others. So, expressing, showing forth God's love, it shows your divinity, and it also indicates the divinity of who you're showing love to. It's worth it to do it. Keep yourself in the love of God. Will, you, will we all do that? I mean, you just picture Jesus there after his crucifixion, talking with his disciples. And he went on the strength of God's love and nothing else to get through the cross, the tomb, all the way to the ultimate victory. He rose away from death. 
moves away from the whole idea. He did that with the power of God's love. Now, it all comes back to what we talked about at the beginning. First, in the list of Christian duties, Jesus taught his followers the healing power of truth and love. You all know that power. And instead of finishing today with some big simple crashing, I don't know, crescendo type thing, I think we know what we're going to do from here. You know, Jesus is our example. We're going to follow that example. He walks in this room, he would teach us about the healing power of truth and love, and we know it. First in the list of Christian duties, he taught his followers the healing power of truth and love. Let's get up from here and go out and do our duty. All right? All right, that's all. We're done.